Mr. Carmichael. Hey, Jerry. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. What's that background? Did you ever see Zootopia? No. It's a pretty funny animation. So this is the, the Department of Mammal Vehicles. Uh. <laughs> and it, it's, it's the home of a very funny scene where uh, the rabbit protagonist is trying to get some DMV information. They're trying to trace a, a vehicle they suspect. And all of the attendants in the DMV are sloths. And so they talk like this. And she's a rabbit and she's in a damned hurry. And the fox who's helping her is like, mm -hmm. yeah, tell me that joke again, Mr. Sloth. It's a, it's a very funny scene. Terrific. So I figured today I'd be working in the Department of Mammal Vehicles. <laughs> How's with you? Well, you know, it's this funny kind of, of existence where we're fine. And look locally, you'd never know anything is going on. No fires nearby? Uh, no. Uh, at the moment, Sonoma County is fire free. That's crazy. Wow. But it, Great. It, it won't stay that way. Uh, so, you know, it's <laughs> a lot of imagination and to trying to figure out what the fires are going to do. Speaking of yeah. animation, they're kind of animated critters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and getting more and more unpredictable and, yeah. Well, yeah, although it's just obvious that this part of California is going to all burn at some point. So it doesn't, once, once a big piece, I think I asked this last week even, but once a big piece of territory is burned, doesn't it create kind of a natural fire break? Uh, for a while. Because sure. that, fuel, that fuel is kind of gone oh, for a while. Yeah, right. So, and you it, know, kind of like a chessboard. Uh, right. It, here, it goes there. So how often can you have the largest fire or the third largest fire in recorded history? Like, like and, and Pete, Pete's answer was, turns out California is really, really big. Well, it's hard to predict because here's the problem with clear cutting is all the trees that grow back are the same generation. Yep. So they're, it's a much weaker uh, system than right. another. So my guess is we'd, we'd talk 40 years. So has anyone, has anyone done the analysis of how much of the burn for each of these last decades forest fires, how much of it was warehousers and champions and whoever else was making paper, like how much of it was, was planted, replanted forests that were monocrops and how much of it was wild? I'm sure there are people who do that, but I don't know it. I'm sure those companies have figured that out. Um, uh, but I wish I, I would love to know that because it's it'd be really interesting if if a lot of this is actually a crop basically crop damage self inflicted crop damage of some sort kind of yeah I think it really is and the amount of of uh, you know what looks like nature is really second or third growth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so have you heard of the book The Mushroom at the End of the World I've heard of it it's it's actually it, it's actually it's actually <laughs> lovely. Um, and uh, the author is writing about the Matsutake mushroom. And I'll, can I spoil the plot a little bit for you? Sure. Okay, so the Matsutake yeah. is prized in Japan. We don't really eat it or know it in, in the US, <clears throat> but because Japan manages to sort of pave over most of its country, the Matsutake has been farmed out in Japan and they were desperate. Like back in the eighties or so, they were like, ah, oh, geez, we have no more source for Matsutake. Then they discovered that in the Pacific Northwest, where I am, they had a lot of Matsutake in the forests. And I'll tell you, the, the reason why is really cool. But they also discovered that there were a lot of immigrants who had like fled Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, knew how to forage and live in the forest, needed employment. And so a bunch of people who were kind of uh, Southeast Asian uh, uh, refugees uh, and, and other people who had left started taking up an occupation as uh, Matsutake foragers in the Pacific Northwest. And then a whole other layer of middlemen showed up who would buy them from the foragers in bulk and sell them off to restaurants and ship them back to Japan and do whatever else. But, but one of the really fascinating angles was that the Pacific Northwest, and, and here I'm, a, I'm no lumberjack or agroeconomist or anything, but apparently the Pacific Northwest was mostly ponderosa pine. Which are, which are gigantic trees. They're not as big as you know, the, the, the giant sequoias, but they're, they're huge, big, beautiful trees. And those got logged out. 
And what comes in naturally, because they weren't, they weren't busy planting you know, regrowth back in the day, they were just cutting down trees and taking them out. What grows back naturally is lodgepole, lodgepole pine and Douglas fir. And what loves a 10-year-old lodgepole pine? Matsutake mushrooms. <laughs> so the Matsutake was thriving in a damaged environment, an environment that was recovering. It wouldn't have naturally shown up amid the Ponderosa because that's not its home, but it was happy to find a whole bunch of lodgepole. And if you're foraging, you go find the lodgepole, look at, look at the mature lodgepole, look at the base, and, and chances are that's where you'll find your Matsutake. So, so her book is kind of this, um, this is the, the mushroom at the end of the world. Her book is this meditation on capitalism, microeconomies, nature, and a bunch of other stuff. I haven't finished the book, but it, it was just like, she's just kind of wandering through these things she's discovered. It's, it's lovely. Um, yeah, we're getting a lot of writing like that. It's, it's quite, uh, I'm reading one called uh, the, the Missing Hand. The Missing and, Hand or Ham? Hand. And of course, the hand that's missing is Adam Smith's hand. Oh, good. So, I, I haven't well, heard of this book. Sounds great. Well, it is. Uh, um, and I, sh I should re remember the author, but I don't. We but can look it, that up in instance. You wouldn't believe the speed with which we can source this. Really? <laughs> it's crazy. It's, it's like we have a special magic genie in a bottle. It's extraordinary. It it's is. It's fun sitting at the dinner table with a teenager who documents every piece of the conversation. <laughs> this, is, this is true. Or it's like being too long in the tavern with Cliff Fabron. Oh, uh, yeah. Anyway, her book is just a wonderful meandering around in the current economy <laughs> with the idea that the hand that would guide things is missing. So you get a kind of chaos and confusion. I love that. And the writing is, yeah. I love that. And we should probably use the Mattermost chat if we can maintain chat discipline today, that'd be great. Um, hey everybody, welcome to the OGM check-in call for Thursday, August 19th, 2021. Um, why don't we go into normal kind of check-in pattern and uh, let's see, uh, Mark, Gil, Stacy, and Mark, I'm calling on you even though you're hidden. Are you breakfasting or? Oh, I am here. Excellent. Good morning. Bonjour. Comment ça va? Bien, merci. Bon. Um, what do I have to check in? Oh, um, I have been pondering a question. Um, how do we embody our values? And I'm, I'm, I'm asking that question because I um, don't know if you guys have uh, checked uh, Society 2045 and Ken Omer's uh, interview there. Not seen it. Not seen it. Okay. Um, so, and he speaks, he speaks a lot of, of um, principles and values and not to say, you know, how to do things, but looking more at a, a, a systemic change of uh, our societies. And, and very often I'm, I'm always, you know, I spoke of unintended consequences um, as very often what we start doing and then, oh yeah, well, you know, we'll figure out the problems later. And I wonder if it has to do with uh, us not really looking at um, the values that we hold when we do something. How do we apply ourselves to changing something or building something or co-creating solutions? Even the co-creating is interesting in itself. Um, so how do we how do we get to the point where everybody shares the same type of values, but um, embodying them every day. I love the question. And as a, as I, th I think this is going to be a, a partial answer, but I think it'll be an interesting answer. Let me do a quick screen share uh, because one of the tabs open on my desktop is this. It's Demartini's 13 questions that determine your core values. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you'll see that it's not necessarily about how would you handle international crises and climate change and whatever else, but but you'll see that these are also really perceptive questions. And it's my intention to sit down and fill these out in this Google Doc, which I have not done yet.
but I created kind of a template for this, which I, and I can share that file. Um, so uh, I'll just read the questions really quickly. What do you fill your personal space with? So that's, that's what you value. What do you spend your time on? What energizes you? What do you spend your money on? Where are you most organized and ordered? Where are you most disciplined and reliable? What do you think about most? What do you visualize most? What do you have an internal dialogue about most? What do you want to converse with other people about? What inspires you most? What are your three most consistent goals? And what do you love to learn about? This is a little bit like Proust's questionnaire, but for me, more interesting, more self-exploratory in a sense. Um, but it's a nice set of questions that as you were asking your question, I'm like, gosh, this doesn't, this doesn't say anything about how I would handle the trolley problem or you know, any, any kind of dilemma you wanted to pose out in the outer world. But it does, I think, have a nice way of finding like what's up with us. And you'll share that, Jerry? Yes. Uh, I'm going to share it in a couple of ways because I've got a link to it, of course, in my brain, which I'll share. Uh, and I haven't been able to find the, the, the missing hand. Has anybody else found it? No. Uh, which is probably a bad pun, as I, as I just said that. But <clears throat> uh, I did a quick search and it gave, gave me a bunch of the wrong things. So, well, what does the missing hand mean? Pardon? What does the missing hand mean? The missing hand is the book that Doug just mentioned, which was about the invisible hand. Oh, and, I'm sorry. Wait. And it, yeah, and it's it's about how well my own belief here is that uh, predatory capitalism and today's neoliberal capitalism kind of relies on the the shared fiction that there's this invisible hand that moves the economy toward balance and equilibrium and does good things for us. And all we need to do as individuals is be greed, act in our greedy self-interest because that levels out on the whole. And I think that the book's thesis is something like, hey, guess what? That doesn't actually work. Doug, did you, did you locate it? Yeah, the title is The Absent Hand. Ah, and, and the author? Uh, that's another question. <laughs> Jerry, what you were just describing reminds me of nothing more than a sleight of hand magician on stage, or maybe right in front of you at a cafe, saying, you know, pay no attention <laughs> to the invisible hand. Um, well, and, and you could argue that modern <laughs> economics trick. is a sleight of hand trick. Look over here, right? Because yeah. good, illusion, yeah. good illusionists make you look over here while they're doing something over here. I, 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 I had an experience in Reno some years ago at a casino. Um, uh, theater, dinner theater, and the magician before the show was making the rounds. And he was doing rolled up sleeves right in front of your face. Sleight of hand. It's called, it's called close in magic. Call what? Close in magic. It's, it's called remarkable. close in magic. It's a whole subset of, of, of magic. It's remarkable to watch. It's amazing how well it works. And probably better at people who are paying a lot of attention. Um, Klaus, you had your hand up about, uh, about the missing hand, I think, or the absent hand. Yeah, <clears throat> I participated um, in an exercise yesterday with the Global Regeneration Collab, um, which was you know, exactly around uh, this, this question that Mark asked. And if I may just take the screen for a moment to explain. So they used the image of these kinds of trees right, to say, um, there is so much chaos in, in uh, our groups. So and no one can agree on anything. There are NGOs. You know, so we are looking like a tree like this, where everything is, is just kitty bumbers and, and how this could even emerge into a common, in a common tree like this thing here, for example, is just incredible. And, and so my impression was, yeah, this is chaos. This tree is, is a mess when you look at it, but it has a common purpose, right? It succeeds in organizing itself to create a canvas uh, to push out uh, leaves, which means it can stimulate photosynthesis, meaning it can grow and nourish itself, right? So what we know about ourselves is... is embedded in thousands of years of observation, right? The best uh, 
case study, empirical data we have is in the scriptures that have described how we function and what drives us. Uh, so the, and it all comes basically down to the golden rule. You know, that is the condensation of multiple religions and scriptures and philosophies that says we have to be empathetic. We, are, we, we have to have, or um, Rifkin, you know, who, who defines this, we are an, an empathetic uh, society or an, an empathetic species. Without empathy and without care for one another, um, we can't grow uh, anything. So it's just like this tree, if these branches started fighting each other, that tree wouldn't, wouldn't happen, right? So we are just like this tree, we are a mess, but uh, with a common purpose, we can grow uh, something that is, that is uh, beneficial. Yeah. Love that. Um, Mark? There's a um, emergent systems notion about autonomy where individual cells, when they form into larger organisms, lose the autonomy that they originally had as individual cells. So my liver cells are not going to become lung cells. There's a constraint that's placed on um, individuals and larger, larger organizations where you know, as I join a corporation, a company, an organization, even this call, I lose some of my autonomy. And this is a choice that I can, that I can make. Um, and there's a lot of passionate discussions and a lot of strangeness around freedom. You know, a mask, you know, is basically totalitarian you know, symbology now in, in some circles. Um, and certainly, I, I don't know, um, chaos is an interesting word that Klaus used. Um, I see I see constraint in organization, not chaos in these trees. Um, but uh, the issue of autonomy is something that is very interesting to me when it comes to choice and collaboration and i'm not uh i'm exploring that but i'm not exactly sure how to frame it yet and that's it for now um love that mark thank you and and being in society is some kind of a trade-off between our own autonomy freedom whatever and other people and what's going on around us uh, in lots of different ways and how we negotiate that matters a lot and a lot of that is often governed by shared fictions, as Yuval Harari would put it, that make up the rules of our society or the assumptions we've been fed or whatever else. And those, those can really cock things up. Uh, Klaus, is your hand still up from before? That's okay, thanks. Um, cool. And um, I, Mark, thank you for, for starting that. And I think I was going uh, Stacy and then Gil, is that right? Wow, so much of what's been said ties into what I've been thinking the past couple of days. Um, first of all, Klaus, with the whole empathy piece, that's absolutely necessary, which I think has a lot to do with what I've started writing. But if I could add some questions, Jerry, to your list, in what I'm writing, the director asks the actress, you know, what is your purpose? What is the gift you want to give to the audience? And how do you want them to feel leaving the theater? And I know firsthand those are important questions because that's what I needed to answer to get from my block. Um, as far as the capitalism piece that came in, yesterday I was watching a, a great documentary. Um, it was fantastic fungi, maybe? <laughs> Familiar? But, but, but here's the interesting piece of it. So I'm watching it and it's really beautiful. And I love learning. I mean, I was especially interested when they started talking about the applications to mental health and how they're working with people with PTSD. And the first thought I had is you don't need the mushrooms for it, although some people may. And the biggest concern that I have is that we treat medicine like medicine and not like something we do every day. So I almost started seeing the possibility of something as wonderful as mushrooms 
turning into something as negative as pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Because as I'm watching, I'm like, wow, this is such, a, they must have had a lot of money to make this movie. <laughs> and then, and I'm not doubting the intentions of the creator. I'm not doing that at all. But we do live in a system. We're programmed, how can we make money? And I'll stop there. But the last thing I wanna say about this group, because again, um, it's being illustrated with Klaus's project and it relates to trust. What I love about OGM is that even as a project starts taken off, the door is still open. I can still walk in and sit there and observe. Whereas in the old way, as far as I know, and of course I don't have that much experience, those doors would be slammed shut because somebody might get your idea or somebody might beat you to it. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to point out those things because that's what I look at my role as here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We, we kind of work a little bit by some of the rules of open space. And uh, one of those is uh, the law of two feet. Go, go, you know, go where your interests are best served and your skills are best put to work. But also um, some people are butterflies and bumblebees. And the butterflies go sit outside. They don't participate in the sessions, but they hang out in the hall. And they're like a beautiful butterfly perched and people stop by and talk with them and, and share stuff. And the bumblebees are hopping from room to room and they're carrying information, carrying, hey, you know what? They, they just said that in the, in the other meeting over there. Uh, and they make those connections. Go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, I just wanted to say, to keep in mind that sometimes bumbles, bumblebees and butterflies can also lay an egg. <laughs> so um, True. let's not lock each other, you know. I think that's something that we do. And I think that's a fear people have, that they're going to be locked into one thing. And we're not. We're, every, we're so many things, different Locked. concentrations. But I think we need to have a flow in some new paradigm that we move into. I think that's part of what's been missing. Yeah, thank you. It's the, also that negotiated loss of autonomy, whether voluntary or involuntary or what. Um, so let's go Gil, Neil, Ken. Um, thanks and good morning, everybody. Um, the, 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 the butterfly metaphor reminds me of the most fun I ever had at a conference. So I was at Greenbuild some years ago and Greenbuild, the National Green Building Conference went from like 300 people to 3,000 people to 30,000 people over the course of a few years. And I was at one of these 30,000 ones with you know um, 20 people that I really wanted to talk to and it was too complex to figure it out. And what we did kind of not by plan, but by circumstance, a friend of mine and I parked ourselves at one of the stand-up tables in the big hallway outside the exhibition hall. And it was like being a coral reef. Every hour, floods of people would go by us in one direction or the other. And lo and behold, out of that crowd, the 20 people that I needed to see passed by and came over. Um, and so it was very relaxed and effortless Wu Wei conference hopping butterfly. Thank you. Nice um, work. Yeah, it was good. Um, um, can I have the screen for a sec? Yeah, yeah. I think it's set so anybody can share. And I'm not. Okay. I'm kind of not the host. We're, on Thursdays, we use uh, uh, Collective Next's Zoom because they're using the Otter plugin. Uh-huh, great. Um, so to Klaus's point about, uh, about trees and order and chaos, I think I may have shared this before, but I just, uh, I just love this one. It is up. <laughs> That's great, I hadn't seen that one before. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's very rich. Actually, you know, I, I'd like to organize an event just around this image. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. That provokes for people. To um, to what Mark was saying about autonomy, I'm struck that um, you know autonomy is one of those narratives. You know, you know, for us, autonomy is important. It hasn't always been a primary value for humans in human history. Uh, so it's just worth thinking about what that means for us, because we are you know we 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 prize that as a, almost as a given. Uh, let me take this down. Um, well, rugged individualism is a part of the American country country building myth and we have pumped it very very hard capitalism pumps it really really hard so we feel it's extremely dominant right now and then you can scroll back to early christianity which in a sense is a claim about individuality also i guess although i'm not sure i understand those narratives uh and so forth and then historically your mileage may vary of course cost yeah just just to gilt's uh, uh picture there and coming back to the trees we showed before it, 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 it's basically coming back down to empathy, right? Everybody helps somebody who is helping somebody. Right? So this tree 
whatever weird roots are springing up and whatever is happening is because this limb is getting too heavy, it needs support. So if there is a shoot coming down that supports it so it can stand up. Right? So the, it's, it's, it is a, a beneficial, empathetic, focused uh, 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 community that builds towards a common outcome, towards a collective outcome. Love that. And, and the, the fabulous fungi people talk about guilds, about associations of trees with each other and trees with fungi and fungi with each other and a whole unseen world to us, speaking about invisible hands, an unseen world in collaboration and coordination. And so this, you know, this, this um, the not privileging autonomy, privileging uh, empathy and mutual aid and solidarity and so forth is a, char is a characteristic of Aboriginal societies. Uh, it's, it's some would say a core uh, message of Torah about how to live together collaboratively in a world. Um, and it's a different story than I mean, mine, how does everything serve me and maximize me? Very different story. Uh, Jerry, you were going to say something? Yeah, you know? what you're saying right this minute reminded me of several things that I hadn't really connected in my head yet, which is the wood wide web and Susan Simard and listening to trees, looking for the mother tree. Okay, good. But also, slowing down and listening to nature kind of is biomimicry, which was a kind of very techie movement that, that had its moment 15 years ago and is still going on and growing, I hope. Um, but then also uh, Masanobu Fukuoka and the one straw revolution and no-till farming and his whole story is about observing what crops worked well with what crops under what conditions and just being highly observant season to season and then tweaking everything. Um, and so this, this, this notion of connecting back to nature and listening with care and trying to do things with nature instead of against nature uh, is a great general principle, but I hadn't, I hadn't connected sort of biomimicry to Fukuoka to uh, the wood wide web. Yep, absolutely. And it's a long legacy in the whole organic agriculture realm, going back to agric agricultural testament from Howard in like 150 years ago. Uh, Wendell Berry famously said that the thing about organic agriculture is not that it uses organic wastes. It's that it treats, treats the farm as an organism. So it's kind of a misappropriation of the term. And what he was saying is, you know, and, and what the best of the organic farmers, I think, do is look at farms as ecosystems. Look at the ecosystems in the region that you're in, look at how they work, see if you can somehow replicate uh, that structure in your agricultural enterprise rather than, you know, rather than an extractive system that depends on imported materials from somewhere else. Uh, because you know, standing forest does fine all by itself with no inputs. So anyway, so there's that whole story. Um, I have been, um, um, and on that note, um, um, Klaus, are you familiar with a guy named Walter Yenny from Australia? Mm, I don't think so. He's an agronomist, I guess, by training. He's with CSIRO, the major National Scientific Institute in Australia. And he's been doing some phenomenal work on agriculture and climate. Uh, that is to really oversimplify it as saying, yeah, reducing CO2 emissions is, is, is important, but what's really important is the, is, the, is the vital health of the soil sponge and the ability of soils to both sequester carbon, but also hold water and support veg vegetation, the transpiration of which provides a major cooling effect on the planet. And it's very oversimplified. He, there's a ton of YouTubes from him. He builds the case very simply and clearly, and it's rich territory, and I think uh, potentially revolutionary for how we think about climate and food systems and what's needed in the world now where we have rendered according to him, something like 60% of the Earth's surface into desert or near desert conditions on a planet that used to be highly forested. Uh, and talks about the, the role of humans in desertification and the role of afforestation um, and grazing and prairie and the right kind of agriculture in cooling the planet and restabilizing it. So um, I, I commend that to folks. Um, there you go. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about systems change lately. Uh, lots of folks talk about it. We, I, uh, we did the Living Between Worlds uh, webinar yesterday focused on that question um, and you know, sort of what it is, how it happens, how, where we learn. And one of the things that struck me, um, and I haven't thought this through very much, but it seems to me that all change is systems change. But some of it is skillful and a lot of it is not. Because uh, you can't do just one thing, and anything you do will have implications throughout the system. And so, um, uh, um, 
the folks who don't talk about system change are doing it all the time. And it may be skillful and it may be, and, and it begs the question always of for the sake of what? Systems change for the sake of what? Um, at the, um, at the future, of, uh, future of Capital Conference we had at the uh, UN and World Bank two years ago, um, very rich ferment among 50 people from around the world. And at some point we were trying to find what's the, what's the theme of what we're talking about here. And there was a lot of argument about it. And we sent the three loudest voices off to another room to argue among themselves and come back with some kind of synthesis. Uh, and what they came back with was systems change for the common good as the story that we were trying to craft. And everybody in the room suddenly quieted and eyes popped open and people said, yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. So uh, that's all, all I have to say about that for the moment. Um, last, but very much not least on the matter of empathy, <clears throat> I saw a very interesting piece. I'll try to dig it up um, when I stop speaking. Um, someone talking about the challenge of uh, anti-maskers and anti-vaxxers and how, how to talk to them, which is already a problematic construction. Uh, and he suggested that the key was empathy. Um, I, I get that you feel that way and that you're deeply troubled by whatever blah, 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 and curiosity. And authentic empathy and authentic curiosity will do something to shift the listening of the person that you're with <clears throat> and open up the possibility of a different kind of conversation between you. It's a gorgeous piece, and I'll post it in the chat as soon as I find it. So um, I, this, is, this conversation is moving quickly for me because I have lots of things I wanted to come back and share, and I kind of want to yeah. slow it down, and I kind of don't want to slow it down. But I wanted to share um, Mara Zepeda's favorite book in the world uh, is Wendell Berry's It All Turns on Affection, which, which sort of is a bit of what you just said. Uh, Gill and very much about empathy and, and all those kinds of things. And it's a relatively short read. And then these are the notes. I, pardon? I, seen, I know a lot of Wendell's work and I've never seen that one. So thank I you. I think you'll actually really, really love it. Um, and then these, these are my notes for this call. So we started with a mushroom at the end of the world, uh, which is Anna Tsing, Anna Lo and Hao Tsing, uh, and so on and so forth. Assemblages she talks about, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then um, I went to Fukuoka's Four Principles of Natural Farming and then found my way toward uh, what you also just said, which what also just got said, which is treat your farm as an ecosystem, which came out of this article, uh, More Crops from Paul Kaiser, uh, oh, which is, who is the part of a couple of a farm that uh, Dave and Claudia and I visited. Uh, so remember Elizabeth Kaiser from Singing Frog Farms, Dave? Um, so part of the wisdom we got on that call was uh, treat your farm as an ecosystem. And uh, part of that, that I just wanted to, to link to it here and show it to everybody. I've got sort of a pattern language for growing food, uh, which is under uh, an important nexus for me, my ahas about soil and growing or raising food, which I put in some time ago when I realized I had a bunch of disconnected things in my brain around these topics. So I put this in in 2015. I created this thought in 2015. Um, but I had stuff about healing the earth, soil fertility, regenerative agriculture, natural farming, the wood wide web, uh, perennial planting, uh, Alan Savory, and uh, uh, basically uh, reversing des desertification, I don't know, uh, bugs, mycelium, uh, fungi, all that kind of stuff. And I brought it into this nexus. As you see, it's not like beautiful and orderly, but it's kind of, this This is a, a, a Schwerpunkt to borrow um, uh, German military word uh, for where these kinds of topics live in my brain. So I'll stop sharing there, but, but. What's um, the German word, Jerry? Pardon? A uh, Schwerpunkt, uh, the heavy. Uh, so it's basically the point of emphasis for a military campaign. Like, like w when you're in a battle, like you, you figure out where the Schwerpunkt is and then you have Nebenpunkte, which are nearby also points of emphasis to draw attention, to distract, to do whatever. Um, and I'm reading John Boyd's discourse on war, uh, which is his famous deck. He basically had a, had a, like a 400 page uh, deck that he would present to people about the history of warfare and all that kind of stuff. And he goes into, into those, uh, those terms. And I find a lot of Boyd's thinking actually very applicable outside of warfare yep. um, in different ways. So I'm gonna, now I'm gonna go link the discourse on war to today's uh, thing and as, as well as SharePoint. But in the meantime, I'm gonna go back to the queue 
uh, and ask Neil, Ken, and Allison to jump in. And Neil, it's good to see you. Yeah, nice to see everybody here too. Um, thanks for uh, welcoming back in as though I haven't been away. I don't know what I've missed. I'm sure it's a huge amount, but I'm picking up the threads as I'm going and see what I can weave. Um, I'm coming to you from Leuven in Belgium, and we're having what I'm told is closer to a normal uh, summer than has been for the last five years. So you may recall when I came in last year, I was doing a lot of hand watering um, to try and keep crops alive. Uh, this year, it's been more of several runs around the, uh, uh, the small lot, uh, destroying slugs in the evening to try and prevent them from eating the organic crop. Um, but in the context of the regenerative farming, I'm sitting here on, on the benefit of 50 years of organic capture into sandy loam soil on a hill. Um, the neighbouring farms, neighbouring homes won't have gardens like this and it'll take a long time to get to this level of, uh, of uh, soil carbon and productivity, uh, despite the best intentions of generally under-informed you know, backyard gardeners. So there's an agriculture issue here that Klaus and others will be very well aware of that we have lost some of those skills of how to keep things alive and how to keep the soil alive and how to keep all alive. And so Klaus's example of the tree, you know, pulling together to do the right thing, you know, depends very much on what it is that you have decided is the right thing. Um, and so I saw from your brain just then, Jerry, that you had multiple things in terms of don't damage the soil and various other things. But in some cases, the soil has been so damaged, it will require a huge amount of human intervention to get the soil back to a point at which it can actually start to become close enough to natural to actually farm it naturally. So let's not kid ourselves that we're starting with a clean slate or natural soils. In most cases, we're not. Um, and in most cases, you know, what was underneath the house that's there now has been pushed into the backyard uh, to prevent <laughs> the, um, the builders from having to go through that stuff. And unfortunately, it's the wrong soil and the wrong, on top of all the rest of the soil that was there previously. Uh, Gil, you had your hand up. Yeah, a guy named um, Ed Hooling, who's an organic farmer from back east, if I find my notes on him, has developed a program working with farmers to, um, to basically reawaken their soils. It's done this business proposition uh, with no investment from the farmer, delivers significantly increased yields, as well as all kinds of ecological uh, marker benefits. And I, you know, from, from the little that I know about it so far, it has the potential to scale significantly in the sense of you know, horizontal widespread scale, not growing a, not growing a unicorn, but propagating a, a simple and replicable procedure out to lots of farms. They're going from, they've gone from 50 acres to 750 acres, and that's kind of the pace of scale they're, they're working at, <clears throat> supported by the Grantham Foundation, which is in, in itself a very interesting thing. Yeah, I'm not saying it can't be done, but in the context of permaculture, we're trying to farm humans who don't agree on what the objectives are, which I think was part of what Klaus was saying. And the humans that have the capacity to make the collective decisions you know, need to be well informed about what's possible. And they need to be starting from a, a current picture of reality, not from uh, false assumptions about what's possible. Um, yeah, much and much so, harder than vitalizing soils. Now. No, no, I, I, I know that. And if yeah. I can continue, the, um, Part of this discussion about empathy and around, um, you know, how do you get an ecology or a tree to function? You know, if you look at pro-social, which is about how to farm humans, um, not in the uh, soil and green sense. It's people um, food. <laughs> exactly. Um, but they talk in there about uh, multi-level selection as opposed to just competition or just cooperation. And the key quote is, you know, multi-level selection is like a tug of war with within group selection pulling towards self-serving traits and between group selection pulling towards group serving traits. And it's this competition between worldviews and competition between groups and competition between policies and competitions between economies and my vested interests versus your vested interests, which are the biggest barriers to the uh, synthesis of the good ecolo ecological understandings that we have. And so the, the challenge we've got is how do we farm humans to actually align with the biomimicry ecological principles that would uh, enable us to act as mycelia in the production of multiple uh, models globally, each tailored for place and existing conditions and preempting and anticipating future likely conditions. 
because otherwise you're planting the wrong stuff in the wrong place with the wrong soils, the wrong people, and without agreement, and you, everybody thinks they're doing it. Uh, and I see I've stirred, it, stirred the pot a little bit, but I'll step back for a second. Just, just for a sec, I, may, I, may I submit that what you described perfectly describes, sorry, perfectly is probably the wrong word there, but describes really well, at least in my head, uh, what indigenous communities around the world figured out um, up until we arrived to stamp it all out, um, and which we are naively now trying to resuscitate and maybe incorporate into modern living somehow. But, but th those groups of humans who haven't killed themselves off figured out how to live in community on their commons. And it was very specific to their location and their language embedded, the wisdom and their stories embedded all of the above and their cosmologies embedded all of the, all of the above. So, so we, we used to know. Yeah, and, if, and you've probably in this group heard me mention this before about connection with the indigenous Australians and the uh, wonderful uh, elder uh, who's Mary Graham. Um, talks about land comes first and people come second. And so it's connection to land and country and it's respect for that. And we don't have that. All of our property laws are, are, are about carving it up and giving it to individuals for them to use, right? And then we have some compliance requirements to prevent you doing absolutely all the damage that you could. But even those fail, especially when the corporations and others pay out the courts and pay out the legislators to change the rules to allow them to get away with literally ecocide. And so I agree with you very much, Jerry, that the part of the key here is a return to become the neo-Indigenous, but that comes with the respect for land first, and that comes with accepting the land in its current condition and nurturing it back to health, not just assuming that I can go and start growing stuff tomorrow, especially when there's 8 billion of us now, not only you know 1.5 billion as there might have been uh, when you know, pre-colonisation. So I'm not even sure if that number is correct. But we've got a massive number of people. I keep seeing the quote by Buckminster Fuller brought up um, about, you know, we should convert all of the, the weaponry to livingry and we can, we've got sufficient technology to feed all the world's people. He died in 1983. The population has almost doubled since then. Climate has changed significantly. Soils have been destroyed. Oceans have been destroyed. Rivers have been destroyed. So we've got to stop kidding ourselves that we can just turn around and do this stuff we can't because of the gaps between people, the gaps between worldviews and the assumptions that we can solve it with technology. You know, the technology we need is right here and here. And we've got to get that aligned with what Earth needs, not what we need. And that means less of us doing less damage in, le in more places uh, and actually actively restoring places. And so, as I say, I'm talking here from Belgium where I'm privileged to be on and honoured to be helping to look after a 50 year old, it's obviously older than that soil, but a 50 year old organic garden uh, and to have seen the abundance and productivity uh, from this place in this season, but also knowing the farmer's grief of trying to keep things alive last year with a very minimal harvest and knowing that that is what's coming. There's a heat dome just down the road in the Mediterranean, there was a heat dome uh, over you know, Oregon and, and California. Fires everywhere. As you know, when I left Australia, it was on fire two years ago. So, you know, we've, we've got to talk about the positives. We also have to face the reality of the negatives and we have to understand where we're starting from and we're not all starting from the same place and we're not all starting from a tabula rasa. Thanks. Um, Mark nice to see you all. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Uh, Mark Thibault, then Mark Carranza, then Gil. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, from what you just said, Neil, what, um, what the word system to me comes to mind when we speak of uh, indigenous people or new becoming new indigenous. If we are becoming new indigenous, then what type of systems that we need to build to support a new worldview or um, at least, you know, build, build a a wisdom around these systems. And if it is to regenerate the soil, that's that one thing. Uh, understanding how different ecosystems work, that's another thing. But um, ultimately, whether it is traditional knowledge um, in, in, in plants, medicine, or cosmic uh, stories, um, they all are supported by a system and the system defined this wisdom, this knowledge, etc. 
Thank so if, if I'm correct in the assumption about the question, it's the, you know, what are the, what is, what is the nature of the system that we're trying to align with? Is that correct? Yes, and also the first question that I asked uh, uh, early on um, at the beginning of the call was how do we embody our own uh, our values? You know, values are based on the value system, belief systems, etc. So every time we talk about, we talk about something, we always very often, unfortunately, we're missing the word system. I, and I'm brought back uh, Greta Thunberg has been quoted a couple of times this in the last couple of days as saying, hey, if we're trying to fix problems within the system and that's not working, maybe we need to change the system. And that should and be part of the conversation. I think every time that we assessing something, you we come, like for instance, we come into a new group of people or a new project or a new something. And we say, oh, that's great. I love what I'm hearing. And then you jump into it. And then you realize after a while that, well, the system, that that project or anything was built upon um, has some deficiencies that is impeding the growth of that or the deployment of it. Um, so we have Mark Gill, Doug, on this topic, and then we'll go back to the queue. Sorry, can uh, I just Klaus, respond? Sorry. Can I just yeah, respond to that? Go ahead, Jerry, yeah. if that's okay. Um, I'm living in Leuven, and the Norbertine monks founded a, a monastery down the road here that celebrated its 600th anniversary recently. Uh, they built lakes in the 13th century to increase aquaculture uh, for the people of this area, and they became a safe haven for uh, people during the medieval uh, period. Um, the way things are going, we're going to need islands of sanity in a sea of destruction. And so what does an island of sanity look like as a system boundary? Well, obviously, an individual who can hold core and embody their own values uh, and actually provide that sort of mentorship, leadership, eldership to others is a, uh, a, an island of sanity at that microcosmic level. What does a community look like that embodies those values? What does a, a neighbourhood or a, a bigger area look like that embodies those values? The problem is that if you're embodying values that don't align with what the cosmos needs right now, then they're the wrong values. Right? If you're embodying values that you think are your values, but they're not actually integral to what the ecosystem needs to survive and therefore for you to survive in the ecosystem, then they're the wrong values. And what the indigenous people did over a long time was co-evolution with natural systems, recognizing themselves as part of, not above and imposing their values on them. And their values became integral with the survival of the whole ecosystem, not the survival of us as humans in the ecosystem. And so, you know, the Indigenous wisdom and, and Gil posted on Facebook recently about his rewrite of Bucky Fuller's um, quote. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, the, the simple three word slogan that I heard to describe the Indigenous wisdom in Australia is so true. Keep all alive. Right. And so it's not how do I keep all the humans alive? It's how do I keep all the living things alive, which means how do I foster and nurture and look after all of those things? And wherever you draw that system boundary, if those aren't your values, then you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. So we're still on this uh, on this tangent here. Let's go. Uh, so, Mark. yeah, I want to basically challenge, uh, I guess, two assumptions that I heard from Neil. Um, you know, a lot of uh, what you're saying is incredible and, and wonderful. But first, on the last thing you said, there's a lot of indigenous societies that destroyed their ecosystem completely and, and basically went to um, extinction. Um, and I'm, I'm really not sure, you know, we got to make some kinds of uh, distinctions between these, uh, you know, um, indigenous wisdom kinds of things. Um, the second is uh, uh, previously this. Sorry, just, for, of... just for, I'll just respond very quickly. Sure. I, I agree. I'm not trying to make noble savages, right? I'm actually saying they survived because they survived. Mm -hmm. And we've just had the IPCC report. We're on code red. We're killing ourselves. Um, and so if we don't become somebody that at least recognizes how to live within our own environments, we won't be here. Full stop. So I agree with you. Don't want to argue. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, I'm very interested in the assumption um, that, um, or, or basically the research that Buckminster Fuller did to basically say, we have the resources to make 
um, all of humanity 100% successful. And certainly he meant, um, you know, the wider eco ecosystem as well. But certainly um, I'd be very interested in um, following the world games that are kind of tracking, you know, the resources versus population versus soil versus um, climate. Um, I, I have not heard that um, we are now past some kind of tipping point where we can't make the world work for 100% of humanity, even if humanity is growing and it looks like it, it might be shrinking given some demographics um, you know, over the next 50 years. And that's it. Um, very quick response to that one. I've got my bells in the background, the call to prayer in the Roman Catholic area. Um, the um, yeah. Buckminster Fuller wouldn't, wouldn't have then been aware of peak everything right and we're at peak everything except for those things which we're still putting into the atmosphere at a rate greater than the atmosphere can take and into the ocean at rates greater than the ocean can take and so when you look at what's happening in california with this water reservoirs when you look at the amount of people to feed with the, the agricultural situation with the way we've set up our economies with the extraction that's going on and with the amount of carbon that's still being pushed into the system right if we were actually taking any sense as elders uh, were speaking to the tribe, we would be at zero carbon production now because we would be realizing we are destroying our own nest while we're living in it. But we're not, and we won't be there, and we won't get there. And so we can't continue to push this amount of uh, pollution from this number of people into a planet that has tipping points of its own that don't depend on whether or not we can economically develop these things because the eco ecology will rule the economy. And that was the, also the point about the indigenous perspective. So that's where I'm coming from. And there's a lot more evidence behind what I'm saying that I can say here in, in a couple of minutes, quick response. But I'd suggest you do have a look at uh, you know, the peak everything, collapsology, deep adaptation, a variety of other things which talk about the rates at which we are depleting the resources that you might be depending on for techno solutions and the impacts of those on the systems in which we live. Thanks, Mark. Um, let's go Gil, Doug, Klaus, and then back to our queue. Yeah, thank you. Um, lots to observe here. Neil, first of all, thank you very much for, all you just, for, the, for the past bit. I have some questions for you about the process of cultivating humans and cultures, but let me first respond to some of what you've been saying about, um, <clears throat> about collapsology and Bucky and so forth. Um, uh, Jane and I had the privilege of doing some of that research in World Game 1972. Um, it was, and and that's, that, that for me is like the, you know, the pivot point in my life and my commitment uh, and the work that I've done. Um, and um, um, one of the stunning lessons from that work was that we have the capacity to have 100% success. The rewrite that, um, that, uh, I don't know, that Neil, that you just referred to, uh, was that I've been troubled by the commitment of a world that works for 100% of humanity because that's too small a commitment. And it has to be a commitment to, hunt, to, the, to the thrival of all life and keeping all alive, as Neil said. So that's what that was about. Uh, but in that work, it became clear to all of us that there was no necessary physical barrier to human success on this planet. People are not hungry because there's not enough food. You know, people are not unhoused because there's not enough buildings and material to make buildings from. It's something else that blocks us. And yes, it's here and here. And I'd love your thoughts on how, how we transform heart and mind and re-indigenize what is essentially an urban planet, so far from indigenosity or whatever the word is that, that you might imagine. Um, but back to the Bucky thing, um, there was very much an awareness of peak everything. Limits to growth had just come out in that very same year. Uh, and in the systems dynamics we were looking in, Bucky, among other things, was not just an architect, it was a trend watcher. Um, and you know, back in the 1930s, he was commissioned by Forbes to look at industrial trends in the 20th century. So there was an eye toward all that work uh, in that. Um, and um, the, the specific parameters, if you re-ran re those exercises, they would be different because the population is eight, not three, and the atmosphere where it is, not where it was, but the methodology. This, you know, the discipline systems methodology of under, looking at the trends, being clear about present state, being clear about preferred state, what would a world that works for all life have to look like? And then re-engineering the strategy from there, not from where we are today and how do we do politically acceptable incremental 
their stuff, but what does it look like and what had to happen in the last decade before we got there and what had to happen before that is, I think, a timeless methodology and worth applying within the constraints, Klaus, that you're, uh, that Neil, Neil, that you're talking about. Um, the other thing I, I just want to, it, it's very much in, in resonance with what, what you're saying. I had a conversation, where's it on Clubhouse about a month ago. Um, and it was um, a part of, the, one of the hosts was waxing enthusiastically about the, 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 the contribution and the promise of capitalism in the world today. And I, among others, raised some questions about, uh, you know, maybe there are some limits there and some problems with climate and that. And this guy went off saying, look, you know, this has been the engine of prosperity. It's brought billions of people out of poverty. It's reduced. When, when we did World Game in 73, uh, out of a population of, of 3 billion, 1 billion went to sleep hungry every night. Today, out of a population of 8 billion, about a billion go to sleep hungry every night. Still horrible, but on a percentage basis, you could say that's progress of a certain sort. And my response was, yeah, yeah, but that progress has been a subsidized progress because it's at the expense of all that you just described, that the vitality of Earth's ecosystems, the fertility of our soils, the runaway of the climate, the demise of the oceans, six, what, 75% of insect species being gone and you know, impending not just economic collapse, but biological collapse as a real prospect for us. All the prosperity that we live on, including all of us, including the machinery we're using now, is built on a fragile subsidized system. And what I hear you talking about and many of us talking about here is, is a call to reality. Is to pay attention to what's real and what everything sits on and deal with the crumbling foundations of, that we take for granted. So I thank you very much for what you've raised, but I wanted to add those perspectives to it. Thanks, Gil. Um, and we have Doug and Klaus on this, then we'll go back to the queue. And Doug, up before off to you, and in addition to whatever you were going to add to this thread, I'm just curious, because I think of you because of your relationship with INET, the Institute for New Economic Thinking, I think of you as swimming among economists all the time. And I'm wondering, how do you have a conversation with many lifelong card-carrying economists whose jobs, careers, status, everything depend on economics to even contemplate a, an altered system that, that deprecates neoclassical economics or even modern you know, kinds of economics to, to shift to something else? I, I think that that's just daunting. Well, it, it is, and I'm only partially successful at swimming in those waters amongst those sharks. Um, I have two thoughts that I want to share. One is uh, pretty complex, but it's very easy to state. And that is, what do we imagine is the relationship between ecology and civilization? I find myself really puzzled by that. What in civilization is worth saving and worth working on uh, that it's, uh, it's not an object of destruction? Uh, so that to me is a really critical question and it's coming up a lot lately in my thinking. Separate issue um, on economics and the, the current state. The Greeks meant by economics, eco home, nomos, law or management. So economics for Plato and Aristotle and those folks was how do you manage the estate uh, for the benefit of the people who live there? What's striking is that the word economics moved into the, uh, the New Testament, uh, and, but translated uh, as uh, uh, something else. So the word got hidden. But what the monastic movement meant by economics was the cultivation of the garden for God's benefit. It was God's uh, economy that was to be developed. And the word economy is all through the, the New Testament in the original Greek. So I find that pretty interesting because it transfers then to the task of managing the estate now, which is the world uh, for humanity uh, integrated into a nature that we really care about. Thank you, Doug. Klaus. Yeah, you know, I've been working in this space for 10 years, right? I mean, I'm, after I retired and I've been in the food business all my life, um, I, I mean, I, I took the first course on sustainability at UC Illinois and I'm going, 
this is a shipwreck. I mean, my God, we're, we're, we're running this thing into a wall. This is completely predictable. It's a matter of timing, right? And then oftentimes I hear, you know, you're preaching, preaching to the choir. And if I might take the screen for a moment, uh, and, and, uh, um, but am I, because everybody knows this, but then do you really? So take a look at this thing here, okay? California is flat out of water. California is flat out of water. They're sucking the aquifers dry. They're sucking the aquifers down to a level where cities run out, out of water. Mendocino is out of water. They have to trucking water into it. So there is no way, no practical way that next year, California is going to repeat this growth cycle. They're flat out of water. There is nothing left in the aquifers. So now look at these production uh, uh, statistics here. You know, where, where is this product going to grow next year? Yeah, and so California, and at the same time, is a stuff. huge exporter of food. So this has global implications. And yeah, we can forget about almonds. I mean, who needs to, uh, it's not on there, but we're actually producing something like 95% of the world's almonds, which use about 1,900 liters of water per pound. You know, we're flooding the fields to grow rice. We're flooding fields to grow alpha alpha to ship hay to China for animal feed. I mean, the system is insane, right? And no one talks about it. Oregon, the Pacific Northwest has lost, um, this year, the Pacific Northwest, Oregon and Washington is growing miles and miles and miles of, of wheat. You can drive from where I live in Bend to Spokane, and you're passing 100 miles of wheat fields as far as the eye can reach left and right. They lost over 50% of their yield already this year. Russia has lost about 50% of its crop. No one is talking about this. So, so we keep talking about philosophy and you know, we, uh, have all this angst about you know, how do we go? No, I mean, we have reached a point that everyone has been talking about for, for 10 years, you know, where we could have easily modified the system, adapted ourselves to it until we are now in a crisis mode, right? I mean, we're now in an existential mode. That, I mean, you, you will see hundreds of millions of people start moving, you know, if they're at the risk of starvation. And this is no... Uh, uh, exaggeration. I mean, just look at the statistics. Uh, so, th so that's sort of. So when I, what Neil is saying, yeah, that's it. I mean, we are we are in inside the vortex right now, and and to think this is somehow magically going to resolve itself is not. Now, so the question then is, how do we create this crazy tree, right, where? You know, some limp wants to go out and be, be strong, but it's going to crash off unless there's a root coming down to support it so it can keep going. That's really, that's, that's sort of what I see. So, um, I mean, I'm just frightened, right? I mean, I'm thinking, holy smokes, we have like maybe one or two more years. Next year's growing season will be critical for the maintenance of our civilization, global. There will be counselors available in the hallways after this session. Um, so let's go back to the, and, and Klaus, I think, I think we're here and we're concerned and we're exploding our brains because we are trying to figure out that puzzle. We're trying to figure out what do we need to say? Who do we need to convince? What can we individually do? What can we collectively do to, to stop those things from happening and to move into a better world? So let's go back to the queue. We have Ken, Allison, Dave. Everybody. <clears throat> I would like to invite you to put your feet flat on the floor, close your eyes if you're comfortable doing so, and find your breath in your body. And just naturally let it deepen. And as you let your breath deepen into your body, see if you can find a, some kind of center in this swirl of information, in this rush of emotions that comes up. What's really calling 
to you now. Calling from your gut, calling from your heart, not your head. What's in there that needs expression? What's in there that needs tending to, that needs connection? Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to check in at all? Uh, um, it just feels like there's such a swirl of stuff going on around us uh, between the IPCC code red and the collapse of Afghanistan, which was completely predictable. And you know, the backlash against vaccines. I mean, I just feel like I'm living in a, in a, in a nightmare. In a bad uh, science fiction a movie. A bad science fiction movie. Like, not even grade B, but like <laughs> grade Z or something. Like, you know, who the fuck funded this? <laughs> um, and so, and I am really, part of me is in despair around, um, the last 50 years, so many of us worked so hard to bring about an ecological consciousness and a, and a, and a sensibility. Uh, I think biomimicry, biomimicry is, a, is an inaccurate term. We are natural intelligence. The earth brings forth human beings. We don't have to imitate nature. We are nature. We are nature in an intelligent form that doesn't recognize itself as such. Um, so connecting to the earth directly um, would be a really great start. I have a friend who every day uh, goes out and lays down on the ground for half an hour. This is, she says it's her sanity. You know, she finds some grass and, or if there's no grass, she lays down in dirt. She won't lay on concrete, but she lays down on the earth every day unless it's raining and um, just listens. And I think that would be an amazing practice. I also have been thinking a lot about um, Michael Pollan's work around changing your mind the people in charge are so stuck there's no cognitive way in these people need to sit down have a blindfold put on them have some nice music put on take some freaking mushrooms and be guided through a tour of their consciousness to come out the other side in a different relationship to the world as we are seeing people doing um, who have severe PTSD and um, who have terminal illness and are terrified. And they, they take one or two of these experiences and they, they're like, oh my God, I'm rearranged. I, I can now be in the world in a way that's not so terrifying for me. I think there's a huge amount of terror. We talked about empathy. It's very hard to have empathy for billionaires and really poor people. It's very hard to have empathy for um, uh, the people we see as, as the enemy, for the, the, the GOP, for Mitch McConnell, for name your favorite you know, villain. But imagine the terror these people are feeling. They're trying really hard to control shit that's out, not in their control, and they're making a mess of it as a result. So, you know, I think of Abby Hoffman's idea of putting LSD in the drinking water supply. Not actually a very good idea because unsupervised, that would be really horrible, but supervised uh, psychoactive experiences for our readers would be a phenomenal breakthrough and I think might be the only thing that's going to move us, move the needle. Um, but I'm, I don't have a huge amount of hope that that's going to happen. But it's at least it's, it's an idea. It, I'd like idea. to see it tried. I so, was going to suggest uh, psilocybin in the congressional water supply, but I guess you're saying that's not practical. Well, yeah, the thing is, I think you really need to be in a safe environment. You know, if you, you're having that going on uh, while you're at work, it's not cool. Um, but, but um, you know, there's, it's now approved for treatment. This is happening for people with um, severe PTSD, and it's having remarkable effects. So... I think that's amazingly hopeful. Um, it's a type of medicine and, and not LSD is, um, you know, synthesized. Psilocybin is natural. It's, it's a different kind of energy. So anyway, I think that would be a, an amazing thing to try. Uh, we can hope for it. Um, and other than that, I'm just trying to get through my, my life. Oddly enough, you know, despite the state of the world, things are going pretty well for me. I feel, I feel good. You know, I have work, I have income coming in and you know, I have friends around me and um, I'm doing okay, but I'm watching the world with horror and I, I'm aghast most of the time. Um, 
So I have to keep checking in, slowing down, breathing, connecting to the earth and, and finding my own resources. And I get into this conversation here and I listen to all the brilliance and all of the, the amazing thought processes that have gone on, the analysis and, and the, the hard, raw truths. And they're all there and it all makes sense to me, but it's also, as Allison pointed out, at some point I have to like turn that down and check in and come back to myself so that I don't get caught up and walk around. Oh my God, you know, it's, it's all terrible. It is all terrible. And there's still an enormous amount of good in the world. There's still an enormous amount of resilience and strength that we have. Um, so I, I, it's really important where we focus our attention. We're in a bardo, you know, uh, things are coming into and out of existence very quickly. And when you're in a bardo, you want to look for the light. If you focus on the things that terrify you, that's where you will go. So um, don't ignore the terrifying things, be aware of them, but don't put too much focus and attention on them or that's where you'll go. Maybe we need good advice, like from scuba divers, like follow the bubbles. Follow the bubbles, exactly, that's <laughs> excellent, you know. Or the, or the umbrella movement, be like water. Yeah. Um, uh, Allison, if you're not too traumatized, you're sort of next in the queue. Allison, Pete, and then Julian, and Klaus, if you don't mind putting your hand back down. Thanks. Go ahead, Allison. I love follow the bubbles. Thanks, Julian. And then thanks, Ken. Everything that you've said, I really resonate with. Um, I am trained as a nature and forest therapy guide because of I, I do feel that that deep noticing, um, you know, we had, I, I'm a teacher in Northern California, so, you know, I teach economics and um, coming into teaching economics at a time when we are addressing um, legally needing to address suicide um, and the, the remedy for that, because it is such a point of crisis is to um, reduce stigma around suicide and talk about it. Uh, of course, that becomes a video and a questionnaire about how often kids ideate. We had something come up in a conversation in the room with Gil yesterday, and it was, yeah, focus towards the light. And somebody else said, well, you never know if that's the light or a train wreck, but it, it is, it is um, you do, actually. We do know. Are you, which, which direction are we focused on? And um, I, I find that coming into a room of young people, um, and focusing on how we are going to talk about economics and the challenges that face us is an, an incredibly delicate and important thing, just like any room that we enter into conversation with anybody with, because so often what's resulting isn't a proactive response. It's, um, I find that I don't like to talk about climate, not because I'm ignoring climate, but because everything that's involved with that word is embroiled in, in, in embattled. I like to talk about regeneration. I like to call, talk about cultivation. I like to talk about how we can cultivate economic ecosystems to create more prosperity right now in, in, the, in the moment. But I do also like to talk about economic trauma, and it was something that I was thinking about bringing up with you all. What is economic trauma? Why is it worth knowing? What isn't economic trauma more, more aptly? And why is it worth being aware or, or using that term, if, if at all? I'm totally on board with the psilocybin approach my own, and I think that it's absolutely a viable business model. I think it's an absolutely viable way for somebody to enter into the space um, with businessmen or with policy leaders or, or with groups of people who are making change and bring them into nature and touch down into um, understanding and connecting and resiting with the patterns of constant existing, never ending life force within all of us. And there's a, um, the mental health crisis is, is real. Eco-anxiety is part of that because our, our planet and our people are shared parts of us. So when we see suffering, it's traumatizing. We call it, right, you've probably heard nature deficit disorder. Kids are out in nature less. And you know what? With all that we see of raising forests and ecosystems and 
coral reefs and ocean floors, there's less ecosystem, there's less nature, it seems. But I propose we have nature attention deficit disorder. The, the lack of putting our attention onto the nature that we are in our bodies and the resonance that we have with the natural world around us and where it is and the rising of the sun and the movement of the just anything. So I've had profound hosting. When we went into COVID, we began doing um, forest bathing walks online because people couldn't get out of their house. And you think, what a ridiculous thing. You're getting on a Zoom call to do a forest bathing walk and it works. It's amazing for people who couldn't even just leave their home just to observe from wherever you are and recognize, oh, I don't have to go out into nature's all around me. And it's about touching in with our sensations and recognizing those as part of nature even as well. And getting out of the story in our head a little bit too, into how much more is present. There are some researchers looking at peace deficit, attention deficit disorder. And I loved seeing that. And I think it's the same thing as what I've been focusing on. So how do we, so I heard a question, how do we get these economists you know, to, to see the light and there are a lot there. We're all economic actors. And I am so, so lucky to have some, some Spanish skills and to be able to be connecting with these women who are doing a radio show locally. And I got on a call with them talking about alternative economies and they call themselves housewives, ama de casa. I said, that is the best definition or translation of economist, ama de casa, someone who loves the home. We're all economists and all of our actions are economic actions. And, and it's just a, for, for myself, I want to bring attention to economic trauma because when we focus on a problem, we're focusing here and here and here and here. And we end up feeling like we need to garner attention towards our problem. So let's just say, okay, we need to heal economic trauma in order for, like Gil said, so that we can think better together. How do we cultivate economic ecosystems? And how do we draw down, not just the carbon, but I propose that far more damaging than the carbon is, is the money that was created with debt that is devaluing but never dying. And with this additional invented thing that Einstein called the most powerful force in the universe of in compound interest that grows those derivatives. So we have quadrillion dollars out there in meaningless, purposeless growth just to secure a future for ourselves. And it's doing exactly the opposite. And I think that we have, let's have the conversations about how, how to create what it is that we need purposefully. And I, I really think that we can, we can do that. And that's what I propose to do with my classroom, with classrooms everywhere, with classrooms connected to communities so that they can grow the, the ecosystems that we want. How do we get investments into the projects that are actually working? How do we do that? How do we amplify an, a return on investment? And um, I'll, I'll stop and, and shut down now, but I thought that that was really interesting getting into a conversation um, in a group that I'm a part of, an international group of community currency designers saying, how do we amplify our efforts together, map our efforts and draw more attention and investment into what we're doing? Because somebody has just spent $69 million on an NFT, which is a digital piece of artwork that you can do anything you want with. You can have it, but he owns it and it's 16, that costs $69 million. Why? Because we don't know where to park our money. So we're creating whatever it is that we can create to have a, a unique digital ID so that we can siphon our money and park it. And then it's all, that's, that's just, it's just hype. But it's okay. It's innovative, isn't it? It's actually less damaging than a bunch of other stuff. But it can give us some ideas on how else we can create these, right? Unique. A forest is pretty damn unique. 
create an NFT for an actual tree? So I think so, I do. Um, anyway, trying to get the conversation around. So if we're going to design with communities, my students design with peace, prosperity, regeneration, and well-being in mind. Those are four measurable outcomes. And if it's measurable, it's a return on investment, period. A city, a county, a business could do the same thing. But we'll just start with community groups because community groups are more flexible. We can start right now. But the other half of the, the community currency people are very much with a libertarian mindset. I'm gonna say, well, my organization is doing this and our values are life, liberty, and perpetual property rights. Ah, oh, well, interesting how that changes our designs. And I think it's a really, really outdated one. Anyway, that was long, but thanks for listening. That was therapeutic and helpful. Thanks, Allison. And, and you've got your feet on the ground with little humans. Well, not little humans, they're probably pretty grown humans, but really like people who care and whose future is in your hands and our, our hands. That's right, yeah. Uh, Neil. Thanks, Alison. I, I loved what you said um, and some of the questions that were coming up there around conversation and also how do we have the, the truthful conversations, not just the positive conversations, is something that uh, I'm working on with colleagues around our offering called And Now What, which is about facing reality and living the questions together. And so I've also spoken to students and I've, you know, you have to challenge, but you have to be gentle. In any room you come into, you listen first. How do you sense into what's coming up and whatever? But if you don't warn people about impending dangers, are you complicit? Um, and so uh, as an adult in the room with children, you would be, care you know, be careful to warn them not to run outside onto the road or whatever. So the, some words just to let you know that there is a resonance in what you're saying, but there's also a connection to the other side, the darker side, that I think two of those things are necessary. Economics ought to be moving away from those things which cause harm, including compound interest, toward those things which do all those four Ps you mentioned. So some words literally directly from something I wrote yesterday. In the absence of awareness, ignorance, whether feigned or real, can be bliss which is possibly why the collapse aware find it so difficult to have conversations that challenge others' happiness with unwelcome realities and inconvenient truths. What if courageous conversations enable people to articulate and address their feelings associated with collapse awareness? What if the essence of directed agency is not just becoming aware of one's future, but reconnected with oneself and one's informed calling in the present? Parker J. Palmer in A Hidden Wholeness says, the soul wants hospitality, but it also wants honesty. It wants to engage challenging questions that we would prefer to avoid. How can we keep the circle open to diverse views while keeping it focused on the difficult truths? If we cannot answer that question, our conversations will not take us to the depth and the truth-loving soul will leave the room." End of quote. How many of us have truth-loving souls? How many of us can show up whole around issues of collapse? How many of us self-censor to prevent backlash at work, on social media, within families, within universities? And then we go on to say, our primary goal as and now what is liberating, connecting and nurturing the vital energy each of us can bring as positive generative responses if we can show up whole to honor our deepest callings in these times of collapse. And we have, as somebody else mentioned here, safety nets, uh, dropout rooms, uh, grief, and my, my partner here is a psychologist, a grief counsellor. We're looking at how do we hold facilitated structured sessions? How do I do the innovative dance around, intuitive dance with the system, listen in, tune in, keynote listening? And how does Anne then provide both the content and structure direction, but also the grief counselling for those that can't handle that uh, in, the, in those moments? But as uh, Doug, sorry, as... Um, Gil mentioned earlier, you have to provide a strange attractor for those who are ready to drop in, not necessarily uh, be the one who stands up in front of the crowd and tells them what you want them to believe. And when he was at the conference, you said you sat there in one spot and the people you wanted came to you. Same with us. There's a warning on the door. You know, if you're going to come in here, you're going to be faced with some difficult truths. You may already know them. right? Same with students. Students that take an elective course that actually says that in it 
have elected to be in that room. And so you have an opportunity to actually structure and frame the conversations that you can have in that room. And so I, I applaud you for what you're doing. I was saying, I think we need to hold both the away from and the towards because it actually gives people the energy and the gradient on which to move. Thanks. Thank you for your feedback, Neil. I'd like to respond to that if that there's space in the room. Um, go for it, Alison. We're getting we're 10 minutes away from the end of the call. And Neil, if, if it's possible for you to share what you read to us, that would be lovely. Yeah. Uh, you're muted again. Sorry, I just tried to copy and paste it, but it won't copy and paste. I've got a new Mac and I'm trying to work out how do I do this Darn sort of stuff. Okay. <laughs> I'll work it out. Thank you. Back to you, Alison. Just, just quickly, I mean, there's, there's absolutely no way that we wouldn't come up upon um, the challenges that beset us. You know, we take a design thinking approach, and so we begin with, with touching base with nature. I begin with a phenomenology sort of approach or a noticing nature approach. We go into nonviolent communication approach, right? We, to understand how to communicate our needs, to understand all of that. We get into um, design thinking, this is relational design. It is what challenge do you have? And so as we go forward, it's inevitable that we're gonna come up upon challenges, everybody. It's inevitable, they're there. It's inevitable and they're, for, they're there for our growth. So I, I just find it interesting, Neil, with all, you know, the, the need to make sure that we're not ignoring the problems and that we're sticking our head in the sand because we, we, will, we, we will see them inevitably they will come. But if we see them as being, oh, what is this as a design challenge uh, helping to, right? That means that inherently I'm looking at it from the perspective of, I see these all the time. It's a design challenge. Whether it's a conflict with another human being, I don't see it as something that is going to then need to sacrifice. A, it's a transformative opportunity. There's synergy here. I don't even, I don't need to engage in this conversation with a predetermined outcome. I need to know that I can recognize what my actual needs are in this conversation and see what their needs are. And oh my gosh, what transformation is possible from that? and what synergy is possible from the solutions we come up against together when we have that frame. That's a non-traumatized frame of solution making, I would like to think. So that's my hope. That's my, that's my response. Thank you. Love that. Thank you. Um, Eric? Yeah, unmute. Okay. So I was just in another group called um, Network Weavers or Weaving Lab. So it's a very similar group, which is funny. It overlaps with this group, which is less funny. I thought but, we have um, like a patent on this whole process. Yeah, no, you, yeah, apparently. No, but it's also an amazing group. So it's lovely to see that there's other groups. Um, and it's also got a very soft energy. And then I started talking about trauma, <laughs> which was not just such an easy process. I was just trying to think like, what is essential here? and what am I trying to clarify? Um, and I remember in process work, there's this exercise where you've got like the high story and the low story. And somebody who's in the high story doesn't really want to hear the low story. And somebody who's in the low story doesn't want to really hear the low, the high story. And how to hold them both. And another level is, I'm quite engaged in IFS nowadays, which is internal family systems. and. I know it's a lot of people there struggle to get a hang of IFS. It's quite an intense process where you learn, okay, I've got parts. I'm not just one person, but one unified mind. I've got actually several parts in me that are trying to relate. And people who went through complex issues or difficult trauma, it's much more difficult than to figure out how to handle that without proper support. And then one of the main focuses of the model is the self with a capital S. And that's like uh, to connect to yourself. And when they talk about how to heal the parts in you that are traumatized or something, it's coming from that self. But then if you ask, how do you develop the self? It's things like, yeah, being in nature, focusing on the positive, um, meditating, um, real positive things. And for me, there, it's I don't have the answer actually. Maybe I sound like that, I hope not. But something like, for me, that's a really interesting place to look at, like how 
to hold both, how to balance them out and be with all that's bad and difficult, but also nourish enough and how to keep that also, even in this kind of online calls, how to keep the balance. Yeah. Um, thank you, Eric. Um, we're nearing the end of our call time and I, I apologize for people who are still in the queue. Uh, Gil asked if Jane could step in. I'd love to uh, hear from her. And I'm glad to, I'm actually very happy to hear her voice. Thank you. Jane, yeah, let me pass it over. And good morning. Um, I'm so moved by who Alice is and, and, and what Alice and what she's up to. Uh, um, she's like a beach and I've drowned and washed ashore on the beach that she is. I feel so moved and I would love to have a conversation with her on debt forgiveness and how we can focus consumer credit card debt forgiveness on paying back our debt to mother earth so that we can focus on photosynthesis. That's the light at the end of the tunnel. It's photosynthesis and it's forests and it's the stomata that release the bacteria that make rain for California and might stave off famine um, because it's very real that we could face famine in the next year or so, uh, <clears throat> not just in the world, but in the blessed United States. So, um, uh, there is uh, a capitalist uh, at Gabriel Capital in, in, in Philadelphia named Richard Vague, who has become interested in debt forgiveness. And you imagine a consumer getting a letter saying, I will forgive your credit card debt down to zero if you will enter a program of getting trees planted in your bioregion and you can document your participation. We need to underwrite that kind of debt forgiveness that student gets loans. student loans. We need, to, we need to get the human being focused on the ecological solutions, which are the repair of the hydrologic cycle, as we know from Yeni and and getting trees thriving and planted and transpiring so that we can cool the earth quickly. So it's a social cultural leadership problem. And I think Alice has the spirit for it. And um, I think there's something we could do with this person. He's a good friend of, of uh, Professor Stephen Keene, who wrote Debunking Economics and is hard at work on transforming economics to tell the truth with thermodynamics. So I'm breathless with the possibility. Um, you're all a blessing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you. Um, we're actually at the end of our time and I have uh, still like a half dozen people that didn't get to check in. I apologize for that. Uh, Klaus posted in the, in the Zoom chat a session that we're having in, a, in an hour and a half, uh, which is a case clinic for Trisha who is on the ground in Costa Rica. Uh, so if you're interested in the food system and how to improve it and you'd like to sort of uh, listen in, that would be, we'd love to have you there. Um, and Ken, thank you for holding us by the collar briefly and helping us sit back down in the chair and ground us a bit and let us breathe into the space. Um, Jerry, Jerry yeah. could, Ken, could Ken maybe help us breathe us out of the space? I was just Thanks. thinking something rather like that. You are muted. So again, I invite you to place your feet flat on the floor. And if you're comfortable, close your eyes and just find where your breath is in your body. Are you inhaling or exhaling? And as you, as you connect with your breath, just naturally allow it to deepen. Deepen a little more. See if you can fill your whole torso with breath.
and just sense into what's gone on here today, your connection with the people here, our joint connection to creating a livable future, not just our connection, our dedication, our longing, our commitment. And in your mind, just reach out to everybody here. If you want to, you can even expand your arms out and just feel that collective embrace. We are together. We are doing what we can. We have resources. And we have each other. And whatever happens, we will give it our best effort. And take that merit, whatever it might be, and tuck it into your heart and carry it with you throughout the rest of this day. Thank you. With that, I wish everybody a, a great day and all of us a great future. Let's figure this thing out. Thank you so much, Ken. Thanks, okay. everybody. Thank you. Go well, everybody.